Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about gun violence prevention with our guests, Renee Hopkins, CEO of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, Margo Bennett, Executive Director of Women Against Gun Violence, and Maisha Fields, Vice President of Organizing for the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. So thank you all for joining. It's just wonderful to have you here, particularly on this day, full of news on gun violence prevention, and we'll get to, to that. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of set you up, and we're going to uh, go to Renee first for sort of the first bite at this apple. Um, we have an epidemic of gun violence in America, and America leads the world in gun violence. Even uh, nations that are at war uh, suffer less gun violence on an annual basis than, than we do um, uh, annually. And there are new uh, gun shootings and, and suicides uh, every single day. So, uh, I was just reading the newspapers today. There, was, there, there were five people killed, I believe it was in, uh, in South Carolina, was it? Um, and and it, 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 it's, it's just so distressing. So we're here to talk about how to put a stop to the epidemic there's no reason to have 30, 40, 50,000 people annually killed in this way. So um, with that sort of said, Renee, could you just sort of set us up with some statistics just to give us a sense of the scale of the problem and how you deconstruct it into different categories of injuries, deaths, uh, suicides, how American families are annually affected by this this epidemic. And, and your microphone is off, so you may want to just uh, <laughs> uh, switch that on. Thank you for that. I was going to start talking on mute. <laughs> so first, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me here today, Mark. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, gun violence uh, kills um, around 40,000 people a year in, in the United States. Um, more than double that number um, are people that are injured and live. So it's it's a it's a catastrophic epidemic that impacts all parts of American society. Um, I think the kinds of of gun violence that we see in the media is actually a very very small minority of the gun violence in total. We tend to see mass shootings, right? And they account for about 1% of gun deaths in the United States. Um, about two thirds of gun deaths in the United States um, are suicide. Um, and we know that suicide is preventable. Um, we also really need to look at the intersection of domestic violence and gun violence. Um, domestic violence is one of the most um, highly predictive uh, types of violence that shows that you're going to commit future violence. So that's a really important intersection. And then I'm gonna end talking about the kind of gun violence that never makes or hardly ever makes the media. Um, and that is the community violence that's drastically disproportionately impacts young black and brown men and women, but young black and brown men in particular. And that is something that we should be centering and talking about every single day um, because that has a devastating impact on communities um, and is not the kind that the gun violence prevention movement has centered historically, um, nor the kind of violence that we read about in the papers every day. You know, it's 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 so interesting. Let's just quickly go through those statistics again. 40,000 annually, right? What percentage is suicide? About 60%, depending in my state, uh, it's about three quarters of the deaths are suicide, but nationally about 60%. So the hit that we have is self-inflicted and the availability of guns and depression, it's a deadly, deadly, deadly combination. Margo, could you um, talk a little bit from your perspective in how you see the problem? Do you see it similarly or would you care to add more texture as um, as the leader of an organization of women who are against uh, gun violence. Your, your microphone is also on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, first of all, we also include men. Men sit on our board of directors. Uh, for us, we have long focused on accessibility to firearms as um, the core problem associated with the epidemic. 
and that that really hasn't been addressed legislatively on a federal level. Um, but recently, we've also started to think about reimagining community safety and our funding and highlighting um, intervention workers in the community and supporting law enforcement that works in the community um, to protect and serve. So we're focusing on protect and serve rather than law and order, and um, also intervention and investment in those communities. And Maisha, um, anyone who was alive uh, during the uh, Reagan years uh, saw that that uh, that uh, um, on camera moment where Jim Brady was was so desperately injured. Uh, and uh, and the president at that at that time and the and the secret service agent who also uh, was was injured. Uh, when we all see that, when we see the most protected, uh, most prominent uh, people in the United States um, gunned down, um, it 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 has a real impact. Uh, talk a little bit about the Brady's take on this this problem and your involvement. Absolutely. I just wanna say thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting Brady to be here today. I wanna to also uh, honor and acknowledge Renee and Margaret uh, for all the great work that they're doing. Um, I've come to this work just like Brady, uh, just like Jim Brady and Sarah Brady. I'm a survivor. And I think uh, oftentimes the way survivor stories are elevated is through the media. And the more, the more that our stories are told, the more that we're able to combat the desensit desensitization that we see across America as it relates to gun violence. We have to humanize this issue. We have to humanize this issue in the same way that we humanized mothers against drunk drivers, that we humanized making sure children were in safety, uh, safety seats while they were in the car. We have to make this a public health issue because it is. And I love what you said, Mark, when you said that there is something that we all need to pay attention to and that is the intersectionality of depression and access to a gun. Um, and so that's why I'm so excited about the, some of the first steps that the Biden-Harris administration is taking to address community violence but also to really elevate gun violence as a public health issue that we can solve. And so through the, through the viewpoint of Brady, we're here to lend voice to survivors, but we're also here to make sure that we decrease the amount of gun violence on a day-to-day -day basis. And right now we know that 100 people die from gun violence every day. And so our goal at Brady is to make sure that on tomorrow, it's 98. And on the next day, it's 97. So that we can reduce gun violence by 20, by 25% by 2025. The thing that really strikes me is that in every uh, six or seven years, as many Americans are killed on an annual basis uh, through gun violence as were killed in the entire uh, Second World War. Uh, that's that's just uh, stunning. I also want to want to note just just um, in in the interest of full disclosure that um, one of our, our really uh, wonderful friends um, uh, committed suicide uh, through uh, through a handgun, um, and this this idea of of the Second Amendment. Um, I think is is one that can coexist with safety, but we really do have to change our our views of what that means, particularly when you think that 60, 65 percent of, of gun deaths are at this intersection of depression and, and accessibility of guns. So let's talk about uh, the solutions that you each propose. And also, if we can talk a little bit about what's going on right now in terms of 
the new ATF uh, uh, nominee, uh, some of the proposals that uh, President Biden is is uh, is advancing through executive a- action. Um, Maisha, why don't you start off? We're going to go in the reverse direction. Um, uh, Maisha, could you just talk a little bit about um, how you see America evolving in a way that also recognizes the differences in our the regional differences, the differences between rural and and urban environments. How do you see this functioning in a way that is respe- respectful of people's interests and lifestyles, um, but also reduces our forty thousand count considerably? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I think first and foremost, we need to recognize that every single American is impacted by gun violence. And for far too long, we have allowed large organizations um, and even leaders to divide us. I live in Colorado. I was born in Greeley, Colorado. It's a rural community. Um, And as I've been in my community here in Colorado, I've been to every county, and I've spoken to people about this issue specifically in urban and rural areas. And the notion that I hear is that it's us versus them. And it's not that. Because no mother, no father, no sister or brother should ever have to bury their loved one due to gun violence. And I love what Renee said, because it's preventable. We can do something about this. Um, Unfortunately, because there is this division, I think it's upon all of us to make sure we bring everyone back together um, under the understanding that we can advance common sense gun laws, like background checks that are supported by 80% of of, of Americans, like safe storage, um, to make sure, and and also uh, identifying people who are in mental health distress and making sure that we have the resources to treat people at the local level. And as it relates to community violence, um, which my brother and his beautiful fiance were impacted by 10 days after they graduated from Colorado State University, were gunned down with assault rifles. And so I think it's also important that we identify what conflict resolution looks like in communities of color. We have seen an uptick in gun violence since COVID because people's mental health is really unstable. Just here in Colorado yesterday, we had four deaths. Two of them were due to road rage. Where literally someone pulled up along somebody who got cut off and shot, shot them, shot the passenger dead. And so we have to call a spade a spade. We have to acknowledge what's happening in our communities whether it's people taking too many opioids, people on drug addiction, people with guns, it's all the same root. And that is mental health and how people are handling their problems and choosing the most deadly option instead of saying, I need to get counseling. So that's that makes- really interesting because what you're doing is you're taking um, what often is provided as, as an opposing view. They're basically saying it's not about guns, it's about mental health. And you're saying it's not about a question of either or, it's both, right? It's guns and mental health. Margo, when you look at this and, and you look at this idea that uh, Maisha advanced, this whole idea of of it being about a number of different issues and we can basically deal with sensible, sensible, agreed measures. Um, Are you finding the kind of support that you would wish to have for that approach amongst your constituents, but more importantly, among people who have traditionally opposed the restriction of gun rights? So, I think that it's a very small minority of people who oppose sensible gun legislation. We as a country really are not divided on this issue. Um, Our politicians are divided on this issue. (laughs) And, And so really America agrees and our constituents And um, most people that we talk with, including gun owners, agree that we need sensible gun legislation. 
we have gun owners on our board of directors and they absolutely support sensible laws. And um, so in terms of politicizing this issue, when the majority of Americans really support regulation, but the politicians do not, that we believe is a product of voter suppression and gerrymandering. And, um, and so a big focus we have is also on fighting voter suppression and making sure people vote because you can see what happens when people vote. We get a president that comes out today and takes six actions, but actions that might not have been able to get through our Congress because they're not really representing what Americans want. We got a question from um, from someone who said that um, that she had a twenty year old cousin commit suicide last year by rifle. Um, the, the 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 one question that um, that seems to come up a lot is this idea of figuring out how to commit these crimes in a way in ways that this this uh, harm self. How, how you use a rifle to commit suicide, um, or um, assemble an arsenal to create as much damage as possible. And we see this um, education occurring through video games and through our popular culture. Renee, um, how do you see that aspect of, of trying to, um, to embed within our culture a different approach to the firearms that is more respectful of the harm that they can uh, can create? Or is this something that, that you see as separate from the issues that you deal with? That's a really good question. I think it's important to realize that, you know, in video games are in every country. Um, this the sort of culture that you're talking about is, is not unique to the United States. What's unique to the United States is easy access and abundance of firearms. That's what's unique. And so I think focusing on the access to firearms, um, especially for people living in crisis, um, is, is our top priority. And I think there are a number of policies that can really help us do that, as well as public education. Uh, we know that waiting periods are really important for preventing all kinds of gun violence. Background checks are extremely important. Um, there is a law that we passed in Washington state in 2016 called extreme risk protection orders where families can petition the court civilly, not criminally, um, to temporarily remove firearms from people in crisis. Um, and I think one other thing that I just wanna, wanna stress that we definitely take a, a very specific approach to is there's absolutely no denial that there's an intersection with depression and suicide. Um, however, most people that are committing violence against others are, have not been diagnosed with mental illness. And so being very um, aware that people in crisis do not are not necessarily diagnosed with mental illness. And in fact, people diagnosed with mental illness account for very, very few actual um, violent acts using firearms. Um, so I think that's just a, a clarification to make um, as we're talking about different types of gun violence um, and being very aware that we don't wanna stigmatize people living with mental illness. Well, that's so important, right? The, the, the idea of, uh, I think there are two ideas here. One is the, the idea of not stigmatizing um, people who um, have, uh, have uh, illness diagnoses. It's like uh, blaming somebody who has a broken arm for, for their illness, right? Mental illness is just a, it, it's another physical uh, illness that has a, has a particular manifestation. And that doesn't require, that doesn't mean that, that it will lead to violence. But I think you're making another point here. And that is that we all go through ups and downs in our lives. And if we are at a deep, deep down, and we have access to a convenient way of ending our life, it's more likely to happen, which is why we have so many people, uh, 25,000 people annually, who are, um, who are taking their lives uh, guns. We just completed a poll. 
Interesting, America annually leads the world in non-war-related gun injuries and death. What single act would have the greatest impact on this? Now, what we found is that over a third of people say that America has a mental health, policing, and other challenges, but not a gun problem. And half of the people, now you're all, you're all shaking your heads. Half the people said, we need to uh, place some sort of limits or reduce availability uh, on, on guns. So is this a question of both? Is this a question of both? Maisha, could you talk a little bit about this? Because your family has suffered the, the violence of guns, but you can also talk uh, about that whole idea of, of where we draw the line and do we have to be oppositional between mental health issues and some limits on guns? We, we talked a little bit about that. How do we bring this together? What would you specifically propose that we do? We heard about background checks. We heard about a waiting period. What other actions can, can be taken so that we ameliorate both sides of this equation? Yeah, I think, you know, my grandmother used to say, um, you can't change what you're not willing to confront. And I think that we really need to confront what's happening at the community level. And I love what Renee said is that we have hundreds and thousands, she didn't give this number, but we have hundreds and thousands of people who have undiagnosed PTSD and depression. And we have specifically seen this uh, in communities of color and even amongst our veterans. Um, and within that, uh, people don't know how to handle conflict again. Um, and so what we need is an upstream approach. We need to make sure that this is a public health issue, not at the, just the federal level, but also at the state level. So that one, when people are experiencing a change in their mental health, when they're unstable, when you are you know, dealing with just be, not feeling safe in your community, I think we have to acknowledge that there's lots of black people and brown people and poor people who don't feel safe in their communities. They're afraid for their children to play outside. They're afraid for their children to go to 7-Eleven and get Skittles like Trayvon Martin. And so we have to address how we build safer communities where people feel safe and they don't feel like they need to purchase a weapon and specifically an assault weapon to make sure that they feel safe. And then we also have to acknowledge where are our guns coming from? Um, because the majority of guns that are coming into communities of color are not purchased through our traditional system. They're not going to a gun show. They're not going to Ace Hardware. They are getting guns on a corner. And I've talked to lots of people, specifically after my brother was murdered. And they said, oh, it's easier to get a gun than to get school supplies for my children. And so I think that's another thing that we address. But we have to have both a reactive plan in place, right? And then we also have and public policy, but then we also need to invest in upstream measures like mental health, education, jobs. Uh, all of the, those things play into why people decide to pick up a gun instead of pick up a, a phone to call someone who could help them move through the difficult situations that we all experience in life. I think what you're saying is that we have to treat our America as if we're one family, right? If, if we have a family member who's in distress, we're not going to hesitate about taking away their guns, right? If we have uh, a, a situation where we see uh, firearms proliferate, we're not going to hesitate about requiring certain limits, right, Margo? I mean, if we, if we start to think not in terms of absolutes, but in terms of family, Maybe that's, that's part of, of the solution here. Um, uh, we just took another poll, and um, it, it's interesting, 100%. We never get 100%. Well, we very rarely do. In this particular case, we did. We asked if, if actions that decrease gun injuries and deaths impinge on Second Amendment rights, are people willing or unwilling to compromise Second Amendment rights? 100% of the people, even the people who didn't feel that we have a gun problem. Even those people in this particular poll felt that 
they are willing to compromise in some way. And maybe that's that's the the key, Margot. Is it is it a matter of just sort of compromising and listen to e- listening to each other as if we're one family? Well, I feel like the gun violence prevention movement has been compromising a lot over the years. I'm not sure I'm still willing um, to compromise that much. I think we have repeatedly watered down important legislation to appeal to the politicians that won't acknowledge what's going on. But I also want to say I'm a little uncomfortable with all the discussion on mental illness because a lot of people own guns, treat them carelessly, leave them out loaded, not locked up. There are so many unintentional shootings in the home. Children bring those guns to school. That's not a mental health issue. That's a responsible gun owner not being as responsible as they think they are. And so um, I think we really uh, need to think about safe gun storage. That's really one of our uh, front burner projects. Why but I that? also think we need to consider serious consequences when people don't. Um, I think when something horrible happens with an unsecured gun and everybody talks about it, it's such a tragedy and the people who left the gun out shouldn't be punished. They're already suffering enough. I think we need to have some serious repercussions. I just don't know how to get responsible gun owners to be responsible without that. When you look at the statistics, it's really interesting. Just look at the Wikipedia page, and what you find is that there are 120 guns per 100 people in the United States. And and if you look at Yemen, which is a country at war, it's 52 uh, per 100, right? New Caledonia has, has 42, Montenegro, Serbia. These are all uh, hot spots um, in which uh, gun ownership is is a third or or uh, or a quarter of uh, of our gun uh, gun ownership. Renee, uh, would you care to comment on what uh, Margot was was saying about you know it's enough with with compromise. We really need to uh, move very very uh, aggressively uh, toward. Um, winning either in the courts or in the regulatory battles or in executive actions um, in terms of, of, uh, of reducing um, availability of guns, uh, let's, um, let's uh, regulate, let's uh, require licensing, let's, let's increase penalties. How do you see your, uh, your approach on this? Well, I think it's important. I think someone, I, maybe Maisha answer, said this earlier that um, people want to treat gun violence prevention or the gun issue as an us and them, as a yes or no. And that is not how the American people feel. And the bottom line is we need to be electing people who actually represent what their constituents want and demand. And I think that's an approach we've taken in Washington state. We have, we have flipped seats from people who are steadfast married to the gun lobby um, and replaced those people with people who are gun violence prevention champions. And that, is, I mean, I think it's an absolutely important for Americans to understand um, that we have the ability to do that. We have the power to do that. And like Margo said earlier, voting suppression is a huge issue that we have to be fighting against. Gerrymandering, a huge issue that we have to be fighting against because we need to have elected officials that actually represent the will of the people that they're elected to serve. And right now that is not the case. It is absolutely not the case. We also need to understand and change culture in America in terms of education that a gun makes you safer because it does not. All research shows that having a gun in your home makes you much more susceptible to all kinds of gun violence, unintentional, domestic violence, suicide, every single kind of gun violence you are more susceptible to if you own a gun in your home. They do not make you safer. So I think back to your point, Mark, about the just the sheer number of guns that we have in the United States. 
um, it is a huge problem. And there are ways to own guns more safely. There are ways to mitigate the danger that they bring into your home. And I think we've already talked about some of those safe storage, waiting periods, background checks, et cetera. Um, but this, you know, again, this us and them is not where the American people are. We're coming to the end of our time. So Margo, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a word and uh, Maisha uh, will, will, uh, will exit with you. Uh, Margo, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to what Renee was saying. And this is a public health epidemic. It's no different than COVID. We acted quickly. We acted assertively. We didn't compromise in our efforts. We moved forward to get it under control. Um, and to suppress the virus. And that's what we need to do with guns and gun violence. Maisha, could you, could you see us out with, with the last word? In your, in your view, what do we have to do? Yeah, I just wanna again say thank you for being uh, invited here. It was great to meet Margot and Renee and you as well, Mark. Um, again, I, I just think that, you know, this is a public health issue of our time. This is the, if, if COVID wasn't here, this would be the number one pandemic epidemic that we are facing in the United States of America in every single state. And so just like when we think about what, what's required to drive a car, we need those same provisions around gun ownership. People should have to have a license. They should have to um, go through training. They should be required to be responsible gun owners as, as Margot said. Um, and then they should be held responsible and accountable if their gun is stolen and used in a crime. Um, no different than driving a motor vehicle, which is also a lethal weapon. Uh, we have the potential to do this. When we fight, we win. And we are winning. For the first time ever, we have a Congress, we have a Senate, and we have a White House who at least hear us. They take our phone calls. They feel our pressure and they want to do something. So let's not let up, let's continue to lean in um, and do the, the good work that we need to do to end gun violence within our lifetime. I'd like to thank you all for, for contributing to this discussion. You know, my own opinion here is that there, that there are two factors. First of all, we have to talk to each other um, and we have to treat each other like family. Um, a gun is a, is a dangerous piece of equipment. And if you're handling a dangerous piece of equipment, you have to be knowledgeable about it you have to take safety precautions. You are held responsible for the damage that that uh, dangerous piece of equipment causes. Um, if we if we just uh, treat each other um, as if we are family members, and if a family member is in crisis, we take away their guns, right? If we it, it, just just deal with that sort of common sense approach. In that, if we just did that we would be able to protect everyone's rights and reduce the, the, uh, the number of deaths, the number of injuries every year. And that's just a start. It's just a, a very, very sort of common sense approach. And, and you've all advanced uh, those approaches. Um, I would hope that, uh, that we're able to reach um, uh, the vast majority of Congress people, of senators to, to help uh, pass these common sense uh, uh, regulations. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your work with us. Renee Hopkins, uh, CEO of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, Margot Bennett, Executive Director of Women Against Guns Violence, and Maisha Fields, Vice President of Organizing for the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. That's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay safe, mask up, and we'll see you next Tuesday.